was a time of mass dislocation as Union forces occupied the country parishes, tens of thousands of enslaved people literally freed themselves, many headed for the city of New Orleans. Union occupiers were completely unprepared for the influx of enslaved refugees in the city, and a huge humanitarian crisis ensued. This was also a time when leaders in the free community of color sensed some opportunity. This is a quote from Arnold Bertineau, which appeared in Le Mignon, and he's reflecting back on Union occupation in the spring of 1862. So we opened our hearts to hope. It seemed to us that we were given a new life and we began to make some beautiful dreams. Arnold Bartonow was a captain in the first Louisiana Native Guard, later the Corps d'Afrique. De These troops were the first black Union troops to see action in the Civil War. They fought valiantly first at Port Hudson, the Battle of Port Hudson. They also <coughs> represented the first black Union Army officers in the United States Army. Many of the officers in the Port of F3 would later become civil rights activists in New Orleans and close allies of the New Orleans Tribune. The inaugural edition of Le Union, September 27, 1862. Dr. Rudnez and his brother, Jean-Baptiste Rudnez, and Tribune editor, Paul Trevine, unleashed this journal. We can see in the inaugural edition a scathing editorial from editor Paul Trevine against slavery, passionate correspondence from Victor Hugo, and an interesting quote, a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln, basically saying to their readers, you know, the issue of enslavement is still with us. Lincoln was saying uh, we can have a union with slavery or without slavery, you just need to have a union. This is from the April 28, 1864 edition of Le Union, our delegation in Boston. And this is a report that's looking back on a gathering that occurred in March of 1864 at the Parker House in Boston. In the audience that day was Frederick Douglass and Charles Sumner, Arnold Bertineau, and my great great uncle, Jean Baptiste Rudinez, the publisher of Le Union, were speaking and reporting on a meeting that they had just returned from in the White House where they had met with Abraham Lincoln. That meeting with Lincoln was generated here in New Orleans in late 1863. The free community of color was growing increasingly frustrated with the lack of progress for racial equality here in New Orleans. They decided to take the issue to Washington. And they drafted a petition of the free colored men of Louisiana demanding the right to vote for both free and free persons of African descent. Over 1,000 free men of color signed that petition and John Baptiste Rudinez and Arnold Bertineau personally delivered that to Abraham Lincoln on March 12, 1864. Lincoln was impressed with these delegates from Louisiana, and he immediately wrote a letter to Governor Hahn in Louisiana suggesting limited suffrage for black people in Louisiana. The Le Union transitioned into the New Orleans Tribune on July 21st, 1864. And this is an extract from that inaugural edition. You can see they're mentioning that it succeeded the Union, which was the organ of the downtrodden race of Louisiana, published in a time when some courage was required in the city of New Orleans to utter words of loyalty and truth. Some courage, indeed, imagine if we can, the risk to life, family, and fortune that these men had undertaken. 
This extract comes from the January 7, 1865 Tribune, and it goes to the extent to which the Tribune was a political organizing newspaper. It is only by coming out in a phalanx, by marching in a strong column, that we shall obtain our due. Let the people know all over the land whom we are and how many we are. Let us organize in one body. Let us one of these days not only have public meetings in the open air, but march in procession through the streets with unfurled <coughs> banners floating to the breeze and tell the inhabitants of the city, here are the free men who claim their rights. The Tribune not only reported on mass meetings that were taking place in the communities of New Orleans of African descent, but they also helped organize these meetings. Many of these meetings were held in facilities that you might recognize, Economy Hall, Perseverance Hall, what were their issues? Their initial issue was what would happen to the freedmen? What would replace slavery? How would the plantation lands be dealt with? And most importantly, who would dictate those terms? The Tribune organized the Freedmen's Aid Association, which advocated redistribution of the plantation lands to the emancipated. This was in stark contrast to the Freedmen Bureau's plans, which gave ownership of the plantations back to the white community, established highly restrictive labor contracts, and instituted an onerous black code to regulate that entire system. This is from the November 29, 1864 Tribune. Let us create a new class of landowners. The national government takes possession of both lands and slaves, and after declaring the slaves to be freemen and citizens, proceeds to culti cultivate the plantations in a way most justly calculated to bring down upon it the regret of all good men. The government should have taken possession of the lands, divided them out into five-acre lots, and distributed them among those persons who had, by dint of daily and long-continued toil, created all the wealth of the South. Sooner or later, this division of property must come about, and the sooner the better. Revolutions never go backward. Give the men of color an equal chance, and this is all they ask. Let us create a new class of landowners who shall be interested in the permanent establishment of a new and truly republican system, the prize for which we are now fighting, and we are sure to succeed. The Tribune also reported frequently on the maltreatment of black officers and soldiers in the Union Army. They also advocated that black soldiers should be uh, sent to the country parishes to provide security for the newly emancipated slaves. Occasionally they reported on issues in the city. These uh, uh, articles come from uh, May of 1867, when there were pitched battles in the city over the segregated car system, streetcar system. Black people were only allowed to ride in star and cars that had a black star on them. And there, were, there was such a protest over this that the city became afraid and actually did desegregate the streetcar system in the world in 1867. The Tribune reasoned that if we could do away with those star cars, we could also do away with these star schools. Well, what were they talking about? The Tribune always advocated for integrated public schools in the city of New Orleans. No separate schools. Free men of color, free families of color had long paid taxes for schools that their children were not allowed to attend. The new Freedmen's Bureau schools were poorly funded, 
overcrowded and definitely separate and unequal. This is from the January 30th, 1866 New Orleans Tribune. We hold that the question of the schools will only be settled when all children, without discrimination on account of race or color, will be admitted to sit together on the same benches and receive from the same teachers the light of knowledge. At that time, there will be one set of schools and all the energies of the state, all the talent of the teachers, will be directed to one end and one aim, the promotion of education for the greatest good of all. Being one nation, we want to see the young generation raised as one people, and we want the state to take care of educating all her children. The Tribune frequently reported on legal injustices. The editorial, Is the Black Code Still in Force, appeared in the inaugural edition of the New Orleans Tribune. The editorial, Is There Any Justice for the Black, was widely copied in the Northern press and brought the Tribune to a much greater audience. That was in late 1864. This editorial came out on December 15, 1864. The Tribune always argued against union policies of accommodation The South, raising the Tribune, could be treated as a defeated enemy, but instead they were allowed to accept defeat without repentance. The Tribune reasoned that the South was able to accept emancipation, but they were unwilling to accept equality. The Tribune reported frequently on outrages in the parishes. One reason they wanted to send the black soldiers to the country parishes is that there was a campaign of terror taking place at that time that would continue through the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th century. I pulled this extract, I've never shown this one before because it kind of blows me away, but the Tribune always pointed out the absurdity of the racial distinctions between black and white. And because that image is a little fuzzy, I'll see if I can find it on my paper. If not, bear with me for a minute. Here we go. May 23rd, 1865. There are very few families, very few individuals in New Orleans whose blood is pure of all mixture. The status of white was a civil or legal character, much more than a matter of fact. There are white gentlemen and white ladies in this city as black as any dark mulattoes. Many are of white mothers and therefore of white lineage, who had a right to attend the white schools and pray to God in white pews, but are turned off from the cars every day for being mistaken, very unjustly, we suppose, for colored people. It is a fact of frequent occurrence that a legal white man is refused admittance in some public place as being too dark, while his friends, legal colored men, are let in because they have pale face and light ears. Persons well acquainted with the city know full well that the distinction of white and colored is a mere legal or social classification no longer, that no longer agrees with the fact. Of course, newcomers are ignorant of this. They still believe in two races, but let us tell them that there is one, a mixed one, left today. From the Tribune, November 10th, 1864. Colored men desire political advancement and equal rights, but they do not desire the humbling of their brothers. 
there may be among our population a few aristocrats of white skin, but they are in a minority. The majority of us know by experience that caste distinctions can only create bitterness and weakness. Our first duty is to place ourselves at a high level of civilization and to, man, and to demand for all colored men what we claim for ourselves. To do aught else would be a scandal in the eyes of reason, a great joy for the enemies of the black man, and a triumph for the sof sophisms of the planters who are trying to establish the inferiority of the Negro race. I put this up because people often ask me if I'm describing the Tribune as radical, but you have to understand that they self-identify as radical. The Tribune was always a four-page journal, two pages in French and two pages in English. The French journal um, is interesting to me in particular because they featured uh, the arts. They covered the opera, they, covered, they published some of the first black poetry in American history, and they had serialized novels and historical works that actually were political in nature. The one that grabs my attention in this slide is the one by this mysterious Frenchman, Melville Blancourt, who wrote a serialized book called Heroes of the African Race, Vincent Auger. And just in a, uh, an aside, Auger <coughs> has a lot of similarity to Dr. Rudinez. Right? Auger was educated in Paris, returned to his native Saint-Domingue, where he organized free people for the vote. And when that failed, he actually organized an armed insurrection. Well, you know, I looked into OJ and, you know, I discovered he's from Don Don. He was born in Don Don, South Dominic. Well, I learned from esteemed scholar Natalie DeSantis, who's with us today, who brought me to the archives in Aix en Provence, that my ancestors did indeed live in Don Don and they operated a coffee plantation there. All right. Well, guess what? The OJ family also operated a coffee plantation in Dongguan. I just think it's remarkable, not a coincidence that this book appeared in the newspaper. Two pages in English as well. Uh, the English edition was a deliberate effort to reach beyond the free community of color that Le Union had served. It was read by Union Army soldiers. It was read by government officials. It was read by the Northern Press, who frequently extracted editorials and published them in their papers. And every single member of the United States House and Senate received an issue of the New Orleans Tribune. You uh, can't see it here, but this is actually the October 4th, 1864 edition of the Tribune, which marked the date that it became a daily. It initially was a tri-weekly, it became a daily on October 4th. Kind of editorial on radicalism here. And here I see General Beauregard. He's featured. They're telling us what he's doing in North Carolina at that time. We see advertisements for a pharmacy and for the Douglas House, which was one of the only uh, boarding houses that would accommodate black people in the city of New Orleans at that time. This is from the January 24, 1860, let me think from the 1866 edition of the French edition of the New Orleans Tribune. And I kind of think of this extract as the Tribune's first mission statement. And I was so impressed with it that I decided to include it on the historical marker that I had installed on the tomb of Dr. Louis Charles Rudinet in March of 2015. How many of you were able to attend that dedication that day? It was really a special moment. Um, I'll read a little bit from the extract itself. Liberty must be the same for all men. If liberty is qualified, those who possess the least rights are not really free. We demand, therefore, like all other citizens, the right to come and go. Think about that. The right to come and go. The right to vote. 
the right to public instruction, the right to hold public office, the right to be judged, treated, and governed according to the common law. The black vote was the ultimate goal of the New Orleans Tribune. We can see here from uh, uh, 1864 issues, the objections which are now presented against extending the right of suffrage to the black and color are exactly the same arguments that the pro-slavery men brought forth against emancipation. They talk of preparing and educating the blacks so as to qualify them for liberty. But at the same time, they were careful that the slaves should not educate or elevate themselves. We claim the electoral franchise as an act of justice as an application of a general principle. We do not proclaim it for a few, but for all. This extract from January 7th, 1865, New Orleans Tribune, is reporting on a national convention of colored men that was held in Syracuse, New York, in the fall of 1864. And yes, Captain James Ingram of the Louisiana Native Guard was sent to that convention, which was convened by Frederick Douglass, as a representative from Louisiana. And at that convention, it was resolved, it also produces a very famous document, The Field of Rights and Wrongs, but it was resolved at that convention to establish a National Equal Rights League to promote the black vote and delegates went back to their home states and that's exactly what they did. James Abraham and his Tribune colleagues started the National Convention of Colored Citizens at New Orleans. It was held in Liberty Hall for the first week of January in 1865 and at that gathering where there were hundreds of black men clamoring for the vote, it was resolved to establish a National Equal Rights League here in New Orleans. <coughs> The Tribune commented on that gathering the day of the meeting of the convention has inaugurated a new era. It was the first move ever made by the colored people in the state acting in a body. There were seated side by side, the rich and the poor, the literate and educated man, and the country laborer. Hardly released from bondage, distinguished by only the natural gifts of the mind. There, the rich landowner, the opulent tradesman, seconded motions offered by humble mechanics and freemen, ministers of the gospel, officers and privates of the U.S. Army, men who handle the sword or the pen, merchants and clerks, all classes of society were represented and united in a common thought, the actual liberation from social and political bondage. Now from that gathering, the National Equal Rights League was formed, as I had mentioned, the Tribune became the official organ of the National Equal Rights League. In the summer of 1865, that organization morphed or transitioned into the Friends of Universal Suffrage. The Tribune was the official organ of the Friends of Universal Suffrage. The Friends of Universal Suffrage transitioned into the first Republican Party of Louisiana. The Tribune was the official organ of the first Republican Party of Louisiana. What's so amazing to me about 1865 is that the Friends of Universal Suffrage in the Tribune operated in a parallel political universe. They had no political power, but they were attempting to create it. And to that end, they organized two voluntary elections. One was held in September of 1865, and that was to elect a delegate to the upcoming convention of the Friends of Universal Suffrage. And the second election was held a month later to, to select a delegate to go to Washington to represent for black voting rights. Now, over 19,000 black men registered and voted in these unofficial mock elections. It was a tremendous display of black power, and it marked an enormous symbolic victory for the Tribune. 
This is from the New Orleans Tribune, October 27, 1865. And in that edition, we find a letter written to my great great uncle Jean Baptiste Rudnitz, uh, looking back on that meeting in the Parker House. And forgive me while I find it, the text because I think it will be easier to read here and there. Yes, thank you. The following letter addressed to Mr. Jean Baptiste Rudnitz, publisher of the Tribune, by our distinguished fellow citizen, Frederick Douglass will be read with uncommon interest by this time of hesitation and doubt. It will be seen that Frederick Douglass considers the right to vote inherent to citizenship and therefore admits neither qualification nor compromise. I won't read the whole letter, but I am proud that a press so true and wise is devoted to the interests of liberty and equality. The time that I predicted in your presence in Boston is now upon us. While the war lasted, the black soldier meant black citizen. The bayonet meant the ballot. But matters have changed. There is a settled determination in high quarters to hand the country over to its former rulers and the black man back again to a condition little less degrading than his former one. Strong men are demanding suffrage for the colored people of the South. Keep your little sheet in the breeze. Hold this one grand idea without compromise or qualification, and we shall come out right in the end. I was presented with this letter by members of the Louisiana Creole Research Association, and I cried when I first read it. And I cried every time. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first eight months of 1866 tribunes are missing from the record. So it's difficult for me to map out exactly how the black community was maneuvering towards civil rights, particularly the right to vote. But I can report to you that there was a convention of colored men that was held at the Mechanics Institute Hall on July 30th, 1866. And these men had gathered to institute a plank into the next state constitution that would ensure black voting rights. They were met with extreme violence. The Tribune was not publishing at that time, or I don't know if they were, but that's another story, what happened to the Tribune on the day of this incident. But a year later, the anniversary, July 30th, 1867. One year ago today, blood was running through our streets, and the report of firearms was heard as volleys of muskets on the battlefield. The spirit of slavery had preconcerted and organized a massacre of abolitionists and black men that was carrying out its fiendish purpose. Defenseless people murdered in cold blood. Innocent men pursued from house to house and from street to street. The assassins dipping their handkerchiefs in the blood of unionists to carry them as trophies. Black children taken out of the city cars and mercilessly murdered on the sidewalks of Canal Street. Wounded men piled up in cars and fired at by the rebel police. Dying men refused a drop of water. Prisoners inhumanely treated in the cells of City Hall and threatened with being hung within a few hours. The backlash was enormous. The massacre became an enormous national news story. And it is widely credited, the backlash is widely credited, with the successful campaign of radical Republicans in the fall congressional elections. They won veto-proof majorities in both the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. We can see from this October 30th, 1867 editorial that the Tribune knew the wind was now at their back. You see, 
the Radical Reconstruction Congress rapidly, re rapidly passed three Radical Reconstruction Acts, and they mandated that the state of Louisiana create a constitution that ensured civil rights for all people and ensured black voters the right to vote. We now have the ballot to use on our own behalf. We have more than the ballot. We compose a majority in the state. And with the help of our radical friends, we compose a majority in the convention. We are able to make the law. We have not to receive it from anybody. For the colored masses are now the masters of the field. Everything depends on the colored vote. It is derision and shame for the white man's party to offer us what we hold in our own hand. Indeed, the first official election was held in the fall of 1867. And I love this full page front cover image from the November 17th, 1867 Harper's Weekly, which is entitled The First Vote. And here we see a freedman, a free man of color, and a Union Army officer lined up to cast their first official ballots. Again, in 1867, unfortunately, there are many missing months to the New Orleans Tribune. So I'm left to fill in a few details from secondary sources. In August 1867, over 82,000 persons of color were officially registered to vote for the first time in Louisiana history. It took a great deal of organizing. The Tribune was in the lead on that organizing. September 1867, over 70,000 black Louisianans officially voted for the first time, electing many black delegates to the state constitutional convention. Trying to close, and again, without the primary, primary source documentation, forgive me, the 1867 Louisiana Constitutional Convention delivered a groundbreaking blueprint for the state's future that included almost everything the Tribune had campaigned for, including universal male suffrage, abolition of the black codes, racially proportional representation, and integrated public schools. And yes, the public schools were integrated in the city between 1872 and 1878. Little known Black legislators were successful in the April 1868 elections for state office and would keep the dream of racial democracy alive for several more years. This, the famous poster of the convention, the Constitutional Convention, we see centered Lieutenant Governor Oscar Dunn, the first black Lieutenant Governor in Louisiana history, surrounded by many black legislators, who many of whom were Tribune allies, uh, the Bill of Rights of Education blank <laughs> enshrined on our right. The Tribune building was located at 21 Conti Street in the French Quarter. It's now 527 Conti. And with the remarkable assistance of John Geyser. John, could you please stand for a minute? John Geyser with the Orleans Parish Landmarks Commission with the remarkable assistance of this gentleman, and after five years of hard work on my part, I might have, <laughs> we succeeded in getting permission to install an official Orleans Parish Landmarks Commission plaque on this building. The Tribune offices moved to Exchange Alley in November of, I think it was November of 1866, and this is an unusual image. You couldn't duplicate it today. Imagine standing on Conti Street between Charter and Royal and looking down river, mid-block. Well, all you would see is the Louisiana State Supreme Court building, right? But back then, what you're going to see is Exchange Alley continuing all the way to St. Louis Street. Now, there in the background is the old St. Louis Hotel, which is the site of one of the largest slave exchanges in North America. In mid-alley, you see this telegraph pole. Well, guess what? The Tribune eventually subscribed to the services of the Associated Press, which obviously allowed them to receive and transmit news much more readily. This is a mock-up 
of the Orleans Parish Landmarks Commission marker that will go on the building. It's already been cast. We're just waiting for a date to install it. And this is the text that you will see when you go down Conti Street. But you know, on New Orleans Tribune building erected about 1850. This building was the location of Le Union, the South's first black newspaper, 1862 to 1864, and the New Orleans Tribune, La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orleans, 1864 to 1869, the first black daily newspaper in the United States. These radical journals condemned slavery and fought for the rights of all of African descent. The black community rallied around the Tribune and organized one of the most important civil rights campaigns in American history, leading to black enfranchisement. The creation of groundbreaking state constitution with strong equal rights provisions and the election of many black representatives. One final word before we open up for Q and A. Uh, I left a whole stack of my cards on the front desk outside, and you are more than welcome to follow me on Facebook, uh, Rudeness History and Legacy. I post there about four or five times a week, pulling extracts from the newspaper. So you can kind of see a little bit of the newspaper as you go along. And also, I use that to drive traffic to my website, all of my research, is hung on that website. It is a robust website that includes all kinds of video components. So I encourage you very strongly to take a look at that as well. My book is available for sale. I encourage you to go to Arcadia Books. All right, Russell is here. Russell carries this. And if for some reason he's sold out, then you can go over to the HNOC shop or the 1850 house. If you happen to be uh, in the seventh ward, you can stop in at community bookstore and get a copy as well. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And with that, I am done and fully prepared for doing it. Yes. Yeah. Operating in such a racially charged environment, you know, runs at the time, how was the community able to operate in, in, in peace about being kind of a 